Hey there, and welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor Josh, and I am so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, paper, your phone, however you want to take notes, and get ready for today's message. Let's jump right in. See, I, I love teen camp. Teen camp is very near and dear to my heart. It's a place that when I was coming up, my youth pastor was Pastor Mike. It's amazing. I had an opportunity to be in his youth ministry. And through that, I'm, I was able to get to where I'm at today. He always pushed me forward. He always encouraged me. And through those messages at teen camp, my life was changed and transformed. The person I was is not the person you see standing here today. Because of those teen camps, you can know that your child's life will be transformed. So sign up your student for that. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. By the way, my name is Pastor John Mark. I get the express privilege of sharing this message this morning. Worship was such a great time to hear those songs and to sing from our hearts to God. There's a line in that song that says, who am I to deny what the Lord can do? Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? And today, I pray that you can experience the undeniable power of God that can transform your life, transform your situation. If you didn't know already, I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I struggle with codependency. I struggle with control. I struggle with me. And I don't know if anybody in the room struggles at all. Do I got my CR people in the building if you want to reveal yourself? Come on. I struggle too. And you might have come in here and said, you know, I don't want nobody to know about my business. It's my business. Let me keep it personal. <laughs> but I'm going to reveal some things about myself in this message that you may not have already known. Or you might have already observed but didn't want to connect the dots. I have ADHD. Remember what I just said. I have ADHD. It doesn't have me. I struggle with that. I struggle. It's, it's not an attention deficit disorder. I pay attention to too many things. There's a lady walking there. There's an exit sign is red. And then there's Brother James sitting right there. I think of too many things. There's a red light there. There's Leon in the back. I can pay attention to so many different things at one time, but not be able to move forward and get those things together. And guess what? I found that out when I was 37. I'm 38. Such a wonderful number. If you've been 38 before, come on, let me hear you. 38. All right. Oh, that sounded kind of sad, but that's okay. I know the struggle. The struggle's real. But I didn't find out until I was 37. I was sitting in a hospital with my wife. She just gave birth to our, our beautiful boy, uh, John Mark Daniel Ferguson, Jr. Of course, I had to name him Jr. Yes, he's so beautiful and so wonderful. And I knew I needed to get help. I didn't realize that before. I knew there was something up. I knew there was something going on in my life. But I didn't know that I could get help for it. I thought I just had to struggle my whole entire life. That this is the way that I am. And I'm going to forever stay the same way. And nothing's ever going to change for me. Until I have this beautiful wife that I have, Cassandra. She says to me, there's something. You might want to go get tested. I said, okay. So I go get tested. And sure enough, the guy said that I have ADHD. And I'm... I'm going to always, always struggle. I'm going to always struggle. But I know somebody who can help me in that struggle, right? <laughs> and I knew I had to get better. I knew I had to get better. I sat there and I said, I got to get better. You know why? Because I have a little son now. He's going to be looking up to me and say, Dad, I, I need you to be on point with your schedule. Dad, I, I need you to make sure you pick me up from baseball and not forget me there and leave me there, Right? <laughs> And when you do, you know, I need you to admit your wrongs. I need you to get healthy. And that's why we're here. Does anybody struggle in the building? I'll raise my hand today. Oh, okay, let me do that one more time because some people were like, mm, not me, Pastor. I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord. I'm so perfect that you've never seen more perfect. I'm perfect. My wife married a perfect man. See this beautiful chin and the beautiful beard and the hair. Mm. Bald. All the most beautiful men are bald. Just want to put that out there. Sorry, guys. <laughs> All my bald brothers say, yeah, yeah. See, that's why I'm here today. I need help. I stand before you not as a perfect pastor, but I stand before you as a person who needs help. 
And I know we're in this together. You might be in here today saying, yeah, I'm struggling. I came in here uh, uh, struggling. Some of you might have been coming here a little, little drunk. You had a little drink, or you might have come in here a little high. Oh, you're laughing. Oh, you might have come in here just finished gossiping. I'm in your business. I'm in your business. Being nasty to your husband, and then you're singing, who am I to deny what the law can do? Oh, want to raise your hands, all fake. I see you. I know the big man. I know the big man. He tell me stuff. <laughs> you might be a husband in here and been nasty to your wife on the way to church. Bless God, you're going to hurry up, woman. You're talk- I'm the man of the house. Oh, God, we just worship you. Hallelujah. Shut up, mama, mama. Don't be lying. I need help. You need help. And today we're not going to be ashamed of the help that we need. We're going to be transparent today. Let's pray. God, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we stand here before you, not as people who have it all together, not as people who know what to do or have all the answers, but Lord, we may not have all the answers, but we know the answer. His name is Jesus. So today, Holy Spirit, reveal to us what we need to change, what we need to adjust, how we need to move. In your name we pray, amen. I love hunting. I'm sorry if that offends you. (gasps) The animals, the little Bambi, oh. I love hunting. And I have my two... Some of my two favorite hunting partners, shout out to Willie Biggins, I love you. You're one of my favorites too. But the ones that I went on this hunting trip with was Pastor Mike, super fun, and my good friend John DeGroat. You may not know them, but you know Pastor Mike, but John DeGroat helps around the church and he, and he makes sure things are on point and takes care of the, the heat when it's too hot or too cold. So you know who to blame when it's too cold in here. No, I'm just joking. Um, this time we had a chance to go hunting together. It was on 150 acres of pristine wilderness, evergreens to the skies, birds chirping, the hills are alive with the sound of music. Beautiful. So we get to this beautiful hunting property, and Pastor Mike walks me to my tree stand. I climb up in my tree stand, sit, and I wait. He walks off. Where are you going? You know... We're in the wilderness. So I'm sitting there waiting. And as I wait, the sun begins to go down. And it gets darker and darker and darker. So when I walked into the woods, I was the hunter. <laughs> hunter. But as it got dark, I went from being the hunter to being the hunted. <laughs> in those woods, there are bears. Lions, tigers, bears. Oh, my. Bears are in these woods. That prevents me from being the hunter that I wanted to be to becoming the one that probably could get eaten. So I got a little nervous. I get the text from Pastor Mike, hey, come down off your tree stand. We're about to leave. There's somewhere on a road that I need to get to. When I stepped down out of my tree stand, I looked. I was lost. Has anybody ever been lost in here? Maybe in the woods. Maybe just in your house. Some people have really big houses to get lost. I was lost, and I didn't know what to do. So I'm nervous, and I'm like, oh, the bears are probably going to eat me. i got to get home to my wife. I know bears like dark meat. I'm sorry. No <laughs> offense. Hopefully just, yes, I am black. I am African American. Okay. And I was getting nervous. But luckily, I had something in my pocket. It was a cell phone. And in that cell phone, there's a GPS, right? Everyone has one. There's a GPS. And I looked at this GPS, and I said, okay, I'm here, and I need to get there. All right, I need to get there. So I look up. In front of me, there's a wall of evergreen trees, rocks. There's some spider webs. But I had to determine in myself that it didn't matter what was in front of me, that I'm going to push through that. It didn't matter if there was another bear. I'm going to run fast as I can. Just call me Jesse Owens. I'm going to run as fast as I can past that bear. I'm going to run through the cobwebs, even though the cobwebs, when they get in your face, you're like, oh, I'm going to continue to run. Because I knew I had to do whatever it took to get to the road where Pastor Mike and Johnny were waiting for me. And that's the same thing in our own lives. Some of us are lost And we don't think we're lost. We're like, I'm fine exactly where I'm at. And now we hear, there's a wolf coming to try to eat us or a bear. And we're just going, I'm fine. I'm fine. But we need to look at that GPS and walk right through those those evergreen trees and do whatever it takes to get whole. To do whatever it takes to get on that road to recovery. God has great things for you. You know who's waiting for me on that road? Pastor Mike. 
Johnny, you know who's waiting for you on your road to recovery? Your family. Daddy, when are you going get, to get, get whole again? I know you got the pain from the past, but you feel like you're distant and you're not. And, you, and you, when you come home, you just glaze out. Where are you, Dad? Mom? So angry at those, those kids. Don't like that. Blah, blah, blah. I know the kids can make you feel a little wild. I understand that. But you don't have to yell. God wants to get you on that road. You're going to do whatever it takes. And I don't know if you're in here today. Do I got any fighters in the building? Do I have any people who says, you know what, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to throw in the towel. I could have quit in those woods. I said, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get to where I need to get to because I got a wife waiting for me. You got your destiny's waiting for you. Your promotion is waiting for you. You need to get on that road to recovery, and you got to do whatever it takes to get there. It's going to be painful. It's going to be hard. It's going to be, going to be stressful, but you have to do it because it's not about you. Oh, what? It's about my recovery. What about me? And nobody cares about me. It's not about you. It's about your kids. It's about that legacy. It's about that little one saying, Mama, can you get whole? Can you stop yelling at me? Can you stop being so angry? Could you deal with the trauma of the past, the sexual abuse, whatever it may be today, so that you can stand and help your kids so that the, guess what? That the trauma stops with you. That you break that quote unquote generational curse that has been placed on you. You can stop it right. Nope. No more. No, you may not. You stop it right there. I had to determine in my life to realize that I needed to do whatever it took to get on that road to recovery, that I couldn't stay in my ADHD state. Well, that's just the way I am. My wife's just going to have to deal with all my mistakes and all the mess up. No, I said I need to be healthy for her. I need to be healthy for my son so he can see an example of a godly man who's not afraid to, to confront his issues. And when he falls, he rises again and keeps on pushing forward. I need to set an example for little JJ. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to set that example. I'm going to push through the cobwebs. I'm going to push through the stress. I'm going to push through the problems because God has more for you. You might have walked in here depressed and say, nothing, there's nothing better for me. God has more for you. Don't quit now. Don't quit now. The Bible talks about these light afflictions, but there's a greater glory. There's a greater glory for you today. I don't know who this is for. I, this is not even the notes, but there's a greater glory for you today. You can't quit right now. You come too far. They should have killed you back in the day. Them drugs should have killed you. That abuse should have killed you. But you said, I'm not going to let that stop me. I'm going to push forward into the life that God has for me. I don't care what has happened to me, but I see a greater future for me. And the, and the scriptures say in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And I'm here to tell you the truth about yourself. I'm here to tell you the truth about myself this morning. We're going to talk about something very, very touchy. You guys ready for it? We're going to talk about denial. Mm, I heard that. Denial. Let's look at what psychology talks about what denial is. It's a defense mechanism in which an individual refuses to recognize or acknowledge objective facts or experiences. It's an unconscious process that serves to protect the person from discomfort or anxiety. You get anxious when you think about the issue that you struggle with, right? If anybody were to find out, they wouldn't love me. If anybody were to find out, they wouldn't accept me. When we confront it head on, we can find freedom. You might be in here and say, nope. I'm perfect. I don't have no problem. I'm not lost. I'm not lost in no woods. I'm fine. But we're going to go over a little list. See if you might perhaps, possibly, locate yourself, maybe. Do any of these sound familiar to you when it comes to your issue? Can we stop talking about it? Talking only makes it worse. If we don't talk about it, it will disappear. Honey, let's pretend it didn't happen. If I tell them it hurts me when they say that, I'm afraid they will leave me. Well, he doesn't drink that much. Well, they drink more than I do. Well, they've been married three times, and I've only been married twice. Like that's any different. What are you saying? What are you saying? I eat because you make me so mad. If you didn't nag me all the time, I wouldn't. Look, honey, I have a tough job. I work hard. I need a few drinks to, you know, relax. It doesn't mean I have a problem. I don't fill in the blank that much. 
I don't drink that much. I don't smoke that much. I don't, and you might be like, oh, I don't do any of those things, Pastor. I'm perfect. I don't gossip that much. What's that? Bonchin Cheddar? What's that, what's that word? My wife? Benching Bonchin Cheddar? Yeah, my wife tells me that. You're not going to be one of those, are you? No, I'm not. <laughs> right? You gossip. You talk bad about per- people. You're always in a bad mood, always angry. What I realize, because I have such a wonderful family around here, and I have a, a wonderful wife, I realized that I was in denial about being in denial. I, was, I realized that I was in denial about my shortcomings. I want her to see me as a perfect man, even though I am the perfect man. I mean, I want to see you as beautiful. Hair flowing. Beautiful. I want her to see me as that. But I have to get honest. And something I learned, and, and one of the brothers in the church, he, he told me this as I was sharing some of the messages with him. His name is uh, Brother Joe. And he said to me, he says, when you deny your problem, you delay your recovery. Come on. It, that's for me. I don't know. If that, forget it. You're not here. I'll just preach to myself. John, when you deny your problem, you delay your recovery. You delay your recovery. We hate it when our flight gets delayed, right? We get all angry and nasty with it. I can't believe I need to be upgraded. You need to put me in first class. How are you going to delay my flight? But guess what? We have zero problem when our recovery is delayed. Well, I'll deal with it tomorrow. It's not a big deal. We're going to talk about a man in the scriptures. His name was David. Can everybody say David with me? David. And, and he's considered one of the greatest heroes of the Old Testament, heroes in the Bible. But David messed up. When I say messed up, I mean like messed up. No, I mean, messed up. <laughs> it was big time. So what David did, this is how the story goes. David, one time, was on a rooftop walking around. I don't know why he was on the rooftop. Maybe it was because in his house, maybe his wife was a little contentious. The Bible says it's better to dwell on a rooftop alone and than in the house with a contentious woman. So he might have been like, I can't believe she talked to me like that. And I, I'm the king. You don't see how I look fresh. And I, I got a crown and I got an army. And like, I can tell my army to come up here. Woman. But as he was on that rooftop, maybe perhaps he was complaining. He looks over and he sees a woman bathing. I ain't seen nothing like that. He sees a woman bathing. Her name is Bathsheba. So he begins to devise a plan. He says to his servant, come, come here. Do my dirty work. Go get her for me. He gets her. He sleeps with her. Funny story. She's married. Uh Uh-oh. A few weeks later, she shows up to the door and says, David, I'm pregnant. And David's like, no, you're not. You're not I'm me. <laughs> David, I'm pregnant. Well, how? Do you want me to explain to you the process? <laughs> no, 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 no. How can you be pregnant? You married and I'm the king and I'm supposed to have this. <sighs> so then he begins to scheme. So he calls her husband to come over and to have a party with him. So he gets her husband drunk so that he would go home and spend some married time together with her. But guess what? He didn't. He ended up sleeping at the palace in the, front, in the front of the palace. So David continues to devise this plan. But he doesn't know what to do. A bride of deer comes to him. He begins to write a letter to one of his commanders named Joab. And he tells Joab, hey, guess what, Joab? When Uriah, her husband, comes to war with you and he begins to fight in the battalion in the, in the hardest part, I want you to take all the soldiers and pull them back so that Uriah is left standing there so that he can die. He devises a plan. So what he does is write this letter, folds it up, and hands it to her husband, Uriah, and go carry this. Again, someone else do your dirty work. Terrible. This is like it's like a novella, right? Like it's so crazy. I'm sitting there reading the scripts, like, oh, this is juicy. What the heck? What the heck? <laughs> Start blushing because the story is so crazy. And then Uriah ends up going to the war and he ends up dying. So David takes Bathsheba as his wife, and brings her into the kingdom. And this is where we're going to pick up in the scriptures right here. In 2 Samuel 12, verse 1, the Lord sent Nathan to David. Who sent Nathan? The Lord. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two women in a certain town, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it. 
It grew up with him and, and his children. It shared his food. It drank from his cup. It even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, this man, the man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king over Israel. And I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if this all had been too little, I would have given you even more. So why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife as your, uh, as your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you've despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. My goodness. The crazy thing about this story is that David didn't see himself in the story at all. Nathan came as the prophet. God speaks through him. But he didn't see himself in the story. And I think we do this when we read the scriptures. We're always the children of Israel but never Egypt. We're always trying to hold on to folk and hold on to people. And God's been saying, let those people go. Let those people go. You've been trying to keep people in bondage through your unforgiveness in your heart. Saying, oh, uh, they, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what he did for you. He forgave you, so why can't you forgive them? I don't, know, I don't want you to misconstrue it. It's like, oh, let's just be friends again. No, forgiveness means saying, you know what, I let them go. I release them. But it doesn't mean you have to still be like, oh, let's be friends. Let's hang out. Means it's kind of, you might have to stay away from them. So we always think we're the good guys in the scriptures. I have a question. Do you always think you're right? Oh, my goodness. I got quiet in here. Do you always think you're right? Yes, I do. I believe I'm always right. I'm the right guy. I do everything right. I'm perfect, remember? I just told you that. But guess what? I'm standing on this road in the woods. I'm standing in the woods. Right? If I continue to believe this about myself, I need to get on that road. Take that step. Get on that road. What I have to do is become transparent. Are you always the victim and never the problem? Well, they did that to me. And you don't understand what they did to me. And I can't change because they messed up my life. And I've been here for 30 years and I've been stuck. Today, say this with me. I have the power to change. I need everybody in the building. Now, don't say silent. I have the power to change. I have the power to change. One more time. I have the power to change. Yes, if it comes through Jesus Christ. It comes through God. God can empower you to change. Nathan told David the uncomfortable truth about himself. Nathan was there to help David repent. And get on the road to recovery. Just like Johnny and Pastor Mike were there waiting for me on that road and saying, come on, we got to go. I want to take you to your house. You got to go to your house. That's the same thing God is doing for us today. So let's go this way. Denial is self-deception. I just want to tell you that this morning. If you didn't already know, now you know. Denial is self-deception. And if we realize that we're in denial, here's some of the things that we do while being in denial. Minimizing. Have you ever minimized? You said, it's not that big of a deal. What happened to me in the past, the, the abuse, the, the trauma, the people punch me in the face, all that kind of stuff, the, 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 the hurt from the past, the people leaving me, it's not that big of a deal. I'm over it. I'm fine. Look, I just, just me and Jesus, I'm, I'm fine. And you keep this thing about you. Rationalizing. Well, I'm this way because of all the bad things that everyone else has done. I'm not as bad as everyone else. Well, this is something I heard. It's my life. Mind your business. Hey, man, maybe you should stop drinking so much. It's my, it's my life. Mind your business. Have you ever done that? Maybe. You push people away because you don't want them to get into your mess. You don't want them to get into your struggle. You don't want them to know anything bad about you. You said, mm, it's my life. Mind your business. Excuses. Well, I'm this way because they left me back in 1993, 30 years ago. It's 30 years ago, by the way. 93. Ooh, I feel old. <laughs> Crying in the club, and the song that was playing, What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. 
don't hurt me. This is the why I'm the way that I am and I've never been able to move forward in my life. Maybe you procrastinate. I'll get help later. I'm too busy. I had to come to the realization that I was procrastinating with my thing that I've been struggling with. I, I, I'm, I'm too busy. I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor at the church. I'm, I'm going to the hospital. I'm caring for people. I, 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 don't, I, don't, need, I don't need it. I don't need it. I, I, don't need, I don't need therapy. I just have Jesus. That's all I need. I don't need any, any help. Jesus wants to use people in your life. Jesus wants to help you heal. You know how God works through people. I'm sorry. Maybe David in this story felt justified in his actions. He said to Nathan, maybe he said, it's okay to cover this up. I'm the king. Let me maintain my image. In the original Hebrew, when it says, you are the man, you know what it says? You the man. So maybe David was like, you the, when, when Nathan said, you the man, he was like, yeah, I know. I'm the right man that picked the right thing. He's like, no, 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 no. You're the man in the story. David was trying to hide his thing. But here in this church, we heal hurts, we don't hide them. One more time, we heal hurts, but we don't hide them in this church. Everyone around David never confronted him because maybe because of the fear of the reaction. Do people not reach out to you and tell you about yourself because they're fear of the reaction? But I'm tired. I'm tired of being fake. I'm tired of denying my struggle. Aren't you? Isn't that mask getting a little heavy for you this morning? Isn't that facade getting a little heavy for you? This jacket's getting a little heavy for me this morning. And I have to become honest with my struggle. I have to come clean with my struggle. You're like, oh, Pastor John, your shirt's ripped. Oh, my gosh. On this shirt, there's my struggles. The shame, the embarrassment, the pride. But if you're sitting back there, you can't see them, can you? You, you know there's something on it, but you can't see because if I let you too close, then you may not love me the same way. You may not love Pastor John Mark. You may not love just plain old John Mark. Because you know that I struggle. But I know I'm not alone in this room today. I got my, my CR family here this morning. My Celebrate Recovery family here this morning. I got my church family here. I got my family here that says, hey, Pastor John, you can do it. You can overcome your, your fear. One of the hardest things for me is the walk. Like Pastor Mike talks about that distance walk, like, Lord, how would you, why would you pick me? You know I don't got all the right words to say. You, don't know, you, don't, you know I don't have everything perfect. But God wants to use me. And if God can use somebody like me, he can use somebody like you. I guarantee it. He can use you. And here's something really quick what denial does. It disables our feelings. We've convinced ourselves that it's okay to be and do certain things or to act that way. We justify our actions. Energy is lost. We scheme to protect the image we, we possess. It negates growth. We take the opportunity to grow away from us, convincing ourselves that there's no problem. It isolates us from God. I'm not saying God isolates himself from you, but we isolate ourselves from him because we don't want anybody to see. We want to cover back up. We want to say, no, I don't want you to see my hurts. I don't want, to see, I don't want you to see my hangups. I don't want you to see my habits. But today I'm tired. Those are heavy. I don't, I don't care. I'm here. This is who I, who I am, but this is not how I'm going to stay. This is who I am currently, but I'm not going to stay this way. And you're not going to stay this way because we're here to help you. We're here to help you move forward in your life. Let's look at what David did real quick in Psalm 51. When he realized he made a big mistake that he was the man in the story, he said this to the Lord. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. David repented. David said, God... You know what kind of man I am. You know the struggle I have. You know what repentance is? It's called, in the, in, in the Greek, in the New Testament, under our covenant, it's metanoia. It means to change the direction. I had to realize I was lost in those woods in order to change the direction I was going in. If I went the opposite direction, I wouldn't, I'd still be there. I'd be lost. I mean, you're preaching from the woods. I'd still be there in the woods. But I, I needed to get to that road. I had to do whatever it took. It didn't matter if I got smacked in the face by branches. It didn't matter if there was cobwebs. I had to do whatever it took. I wanted to go from just actually looking like I'm a hunter to actually being one. Instead of going from looking okay, I actually want to be okay. That's why I stand here today with this shirt with my struggles written on it. Our pride keeps us from the help we need. Great, Pastor John. Great. Thanks. Thanks for telling me that I have problems. I already knew that. What am I going to do about it? 
In James 1.22, it says, don't merely listen to the word. Don't listen to what I'm just saying. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word and does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what, he's, what he looks like. But whoever looks in, intently into the perfect law of liberty that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they'll be blessed in all that they do. I'm not going to go away and say, oh, well, I forget it. I don't have time. It's too much. Maybe you don't even realize you're in denial this morning. So I, I have some of these points that are going to help you. Ask God to show you where you are in denial. God will illuminate it. See, in that story, I needed something outside of myself to get back on the road. I needed my GPS to tell me, go this way. This is the way. Walk ye in it. Go, go, go. Same with you. You're going to need to look and look to God to point out, say, hey, where can I change? Search me, oh God. Know my ways. His word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Second one, ask those around you. In Proverbs it says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. My wife, she's faithful to me. She says, hey, you got to change, John. You can't keep not listening the way, you know, you say you're listening, but you're not listening. You're, you can repeat everything back to me, but I don't feel like you're listening to me. I'm fine. I'm, I'm listening. You don't hear me? I'm listening. But I need to say, yes, you know what? Maybe you're right. How can I listen to you better? Because I need to set an example for my son. I need to set an example for my family. Allow yourself to get the help you need. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. God will help you. We are here to help you. We are here to help you here at Family Church. Whatever you need, we are here to help you. On the other side of your denial is your dream, is your deliverance. I remember going to celebrate recovery and I was afraid the first time. I'm Pastor John, I'm supposed to have everything together. I'm the care pastor church. I'm supposed to know all of these things and, 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 and be in practice. But I had to get honest with myself and say, I have issues, I need help. I walked up those stairs and I was afraid. I said, maybe someone won't love me. But then I found a band of brothers who love me just the way I am. Who said, hey, John Mark, I got you. I had my brothers praying for me this weekend as I prepared this message. And they were there for me. They, they came to the service and they, and they loved on me. He says, man, I, I love you. I'm here for you. And that's what you can find. You can find a forever family at Celebrate Recovery. If that's you, I want you to stop by the table. When, when we close, I want you to stop right by the table and, and go out there and talk to somebody. Somebody's there to help you come out of your denial. Somebody's there to help you. We're going to have a care team at the front. I'm going to be here at the front. I'll pray for you. God wants to empower you. God wants to transform your life. You just have to let him in. I don't want there to be a mistake this morning or a confusion. Jesus is the road to recovery. He's the way. That's why he called himself the way. You need to get out of your way to get to Yahweh. One of my friends just told me that, but that's amazing. That you need to get out of your way to get to Yahweh, okay? You need to get onto the road to come. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father except through me. If you need freedom today, it's only found through Jesus Christ. You might say, Pastor John, your, your, your sermon's cute. Your little cut shirt's cute and all. But I don't know this Jesus. And if that's you today, you say, I want to know this Jesus today. We're going to pray this prayer as a family. And you can find yourself on the road to the recovery. You can find yourself on the way to recovery. So let's bow our heads and let's pray this prayer together. God... I come to you just as I am, and I thank you for sending Jesus to die for me and rise again to bring me new life. Jesus, I believe that you are Lord, and I receive your free gift of salvation. In your name I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time watching online, our online host will, will put, drop something into the chat for you to be able to fill out the connect card. If you're in the room, if you prayed that prayer in this room, I, I just want to celebrate you. If you can raise your hand, wave at me and say, I prayed that prayer. I prayed that prayer. Somebody, one, one back there. Two, three. Anybody else? Our care team members are going to get up right now and bring you a resource because we believe that you need some help. You need your, your next steps. And we have a book called Starting Point that helps you on your first seven-day journey with God. It teaches you what just happened. We also have a book on the chair pocket in front of you. It's called Welcome Home. And we have that book available for you. We ask that you take those resources, learn them, read them, and then come back. We want to help you grow. We want to help you take your next steps. You might be in here today and say, you know what, uh, Pastor John, I didn't need salvation today. I already know Jesus. But I'm in denial. I'm like, oh, denial about what? Denial about the God can help you in your situation. You think you're too far gone. 
You think you're too far into that depression. You think you're too far into that anxiety. You think you're too far into those, those secret things that nobody knows. But God can bring you out today. He can deliver you right now and put you on the road to recovery. So you don't have to continue to be the same person year after year after year. You can transform and keep on moving from glory to glory to glory. Guess what? Today, I'm going to take another step out of the woods, out of the woods of denial onto the road to recovery. I'm going to step. I need some people who are going to want to step with me this morning. I need some people who are going to say, I'm going to keep walking, God. No matter what may be standing in my way, I'm going to push through. There's something greater in me because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It is time to move out of your struggle and into the recovery today. I'm going to have the care team members come up, and we're going to be available for you to pray with you. I'll stand here all day if you need prayer. I'll be here because I know what it's like to struggle and say, I don't have any hope. But hope can be found in Jesus this morning. Let's pray today. God, I come to you just like I am. And Heavenly Father, you see your people before you. They need your help. Your ear is never deaf to the cry of the righteous. And these are your righteous people. So, Lord, change them transform their lives. Lord, today as they come forward and, and, and need prayer, God, do a work that you could only do in them. Help them to take that step and come out of denial because you have so many great things for them today. I bless your people. That they are blessed in the city, blessed in the field. That whatever they set their hands to will prosper. That they are more. That you are a God of more than enough, so you've empowered them more than enough. That you're able to exceeding abundantly above all they can ask and think according to the power that works within them. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless Thanks you. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor Josh. And if this message has impacted you in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a few things. First, I would love if you would subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 930 and 1130 a.m. Second thing is, I'm going to ask that you would take a next step on your journey. And we'd love to help you do that. You can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today. Have a great rest of your day.